Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 141. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. Steve Jobs. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Distriber. If you guys are trying to get your movies or feature films or even shorts onto Netflix, Hulu, Google Play, iTunes, Fandango, or any of the major streaming services, Distriber finally lets you in without having to go through a traditional distributor. And you keep 100% of all the revenues and your rights. So if you want more information, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash sell my film. The show is also sponsored by Hollywood Camera Work. If you guys are interested in learning how to direct actors and become an actor's director, Hollywood Camera Work has developed an amazing master course called Directing Actors. And it is almost 30 hours, and I've taken this course, and it is by far the most comprehensive directing actors course I have ever seen. So if you want to get access to this course, head over to hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code Hustle to get 30% off. That's hollywoodcamerawork.com and use the coupon code Hustle. So today on the show, guys, we have a producer who um, I've talked about a specific film a lot on the show as a as an example of how to do it right as far as social media, as far as building multiple revenue streams. Uh, and his film is called Turbo Kid and it was done in 2015. And uh, it's a really Really interesting film and how they were able to target their demographic, their um, their audience, how they use social media, how they've created uh, kind of like a like a following, a major following kind of phenomenon around this movie it was remarkable. So I wanted to get the producer Shakid Berenson from uh, Epic Pictures, and uh, Shakid uh, and I we also hung out a little bit at Sundance and talked a whole bunch about the business. In this interview, we actually. You know, he breaks down what he his journeys through the business, how he's an independent producer and how he's able to build his own ecosystems without having to go outside to big studios or anything like that. So he is a production company. He develops projects. He he produces them and he also distributes them. He's all within the same ecosystem and uh, and how he's able to do that and and create different revenue streams uh, and we uh, different revenue streams per project. And he, we also go deep into Turbo Kid because I really wanted to ask a lot of questions about Turbo Kid in regards to merchandising, in regards to how he got a distributor, how he got foreign over, you know, because Turbo Kid was everywhere and it still is. Uh, and they did a theatrical release and how they did all that and the whole process. So I really wanted to go deep down the rabbit hole of how he did uh, everything he did for Turbo Kid, but also uh, for everything he does in his business. And he's really inspiring in how he was able to put it all together and how he continues to put it all together. So uh, without any further ado, here's my conversation with Shaked Berenson. I'd like to welcome to the show Shaked Berenson, man. Thank you so much for taking out the time uh, and uh, talking to the tribe. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a perfect day because uh, everybody's working from home today. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I wanted to ask you, how did you get into the business? Because this is a crazy business. I always love to ask my guests, what made you want to jump into this business? I think it's a bit uh, non-traditional because I was, um, I won't say a film buff because I know real film buff and it's very different than me. I grew up in Israel and as many of those countries, we don't get a lot of the independent movies. We basically have in theaters all the studio films, but uh, but there are people passionate about the filmmaking process. And I was playing with one of those uh, DV camera with my friends, you know, I'm sure everybody did the same uh, videos in their backyard, you know, when they're abusing the dog and the cat and uh, <laughs> all sorts of uh, fake James Bond uh, missions sure, sure. to uh, abandoned houses and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, but I never really thought that it's going to be a career. I mean, I was in communication uh, program in high school and theater, uh, but it was more of a hobby. And then um, in Israel, you know, you, you have mandatory military service and, uh, I did uh, four and a half years. So I was a bit older and, uh, because I was actually born in the U S I always knew that 
I want to check out my my second home after I finish my service. Mm-hmm. So I have some family here in uh, in LA, and there is a lot of good schools, you know, between uh, Berkeley and USC and UCLA and uh, great uh, public schools. So I came here and uh, really just coming to go to university, and I was looking for a job as a bartender. Uh, and funny enough, I couldn't find a job as a bartender, so I started to work in a movie business. <laughs> So you made it some, it's usually the other way around. People start bartending because they can't find jobs in the movie business. <laughs> Everybody has the same reaction, but it's really true because I was new in town. I didn't have a lot of friends. Um, I want to go to school. Bartending is a great job. You meet a lot of people. Uh, you meet you know women and you work weekends and nights. So it was a perfect job for me. But mm-hmm. gosh, I just could not find a job. And then I met um, a producer and became his personal assistant. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, it was one of those companies that uh, when people leave or or fired or quit, uh, I just slowly started taking over people's jobs. Uh, Mm -hmm. Of course, not getting more money, but... uh, No, 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 of course not. Of course, yeah. But uh, very uh, quickly, I I started to do development, I started to do marketing, I started to do uh, delivery and servicing. That is probably something that... uh, uh, most people don't even uh, know too much about because, you know, it's not something you learn in film school. Um, and uh, I got into production from PA, foreign sales. And within just a few years, I kind of seen the entire process. Uh, then the company started, the company was growing and uh, making big studio films. We, uh, we made with Sony a movie called Ghost Rider, the, the first mm-hmm. one. Sure. And... Uh, but the company started as independent film, and Patrick Ewald, who's now my uh, business partner, uh, he was VP of production, and he convinced the owner, because he's a big uh, genre fan, to uh, start a division uh, to do uh, genre films. And, of course, because I'm the guy that always gets more jobs, I was assigned to also work with him on that. Mm-hmm. So uh, first movie, let me think. The first movie we did was uh, Blood River with uh, director Adam Mason and um, – which we end up selling to Weinstein Company. Then we made with the same director a film called The Devil's Chair that got into the Toronto Midnight uh, section, which was a uh, uh, baby at the time mm-hmm. uh, and was growing. But the movie ended up with uh, Sony for Worldwide. Uh, so we were developing and making our own movies, getting them financed, uh, selling them and, and getting them dis- distributed internationally. And at some point we just, decided to branch off and start our own company. Nice. Uh, now, what, now you, you, are produ- you have produced a lot of genre films. Is there something that draws you to those kind of stories? Um, you know, maybe it's not a good answer, but uh, I, I like the process more than... Uh, I'm a big fan of almost every genre. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not in particular uh, horror or action or, or anything like that. If anything, sci-fi probably would be more of my interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just like the process. For me, what, what really exciting about filmmaking that, again, my, my starting the business was kind of non-traditional and also probably my motivation on, is not uh, as traditional. But I like the fact that, you know, you and I can be on the podcast right now mm-hmm. and just come up with an idea for a film, hire a writer. A few months later, we're going to have 50 people working on set, creating all these jobs. Mm-hmm. Then movie goes into post-production. Maybe there is computer graphics company in India or, or Korea or Canada or I don't know what. And, mm-hmm. and we're creating jobs for another 50 or 100 people. Then we sell it internationally. Every country has people working, if it's in the theaters, dubbing, marketing. I mean, it's just amazing to me how you can have a beer and come up with an idea and end up having a refill effect and create so many jobs for so many people around the world. So for me, that's really the exciting, uh, the exciting part. That's uh, a that's a great answer. That's actually a great answer. <laughs> I've never had someone answer like that before. <laughs> it's it's I great because you're looking at it and you're looking at it as a more holistic uh, avenue as opposed to just you know looking five feet in front of you. You're looking at the whole journey. Fortunate to have the opportunity to really work in all those stages. And now uh, you know, Epic is is basically an independent studio. We do everything from buying uh, IPs or coming up with uh, our own ideas mm-hmm. and doing the development, getting the financing, doing the physical production. Mm-hmm. We do foreign sales, so we place the films uh, in uh, every country. And we have now in the past two years, we've developed our uh, domestic distribution. So we're also releasing the films uh, in theaters and on digital and television here in the U.S. and have the opportunity to actually touch the customer and uh, and see the fans. You know, usually we see them in film festivals. 
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But now we can actually interact and, and uh, go directly to them. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting to be able to uh, uh, sit in a staff meeting and just somebody's like, hey, I read a book that I really like this weekend. And two or three years later, you have it out in theaters or Netflix and, and, and actually have reviews and, and having it out there. So I think, uh, I think we're all fortunate really to be in this uh, industry and be able to do that. Now, you, you, were, you brought up a little bit about distribution. And, and considering that the world has changed dramatically since when you first got into the business as far as distribution and pre-sales and foreign sales and all of that stuff, the world has changed so much. What is your outlook on how things are, are going today in distribution and getting your films out there? And what do you guys do specifically? So, uh, yeah, they all change a lot. Uh, I think the big turnaround was around 2008, uh, which is right after we started the company. And we we're lucky because we started in the end of two, 2007. And, you know, with the economic crash mm-hmm. and everything, we we're just two and a half people in a living room. So, <laughs> Uh, we were able to render the the bad times, but uh, yeah, I, I I do remember and have reports from the good old days when home video was king. <laughs> yeah, you could make a movie for two million and sell it for twenty million, and now it's it's pretty much the opposite. So you need to be a lot more clever about how you structure your financing uh, and have a lot less exposure. So uh, that means and and again, I think we we're living in a very exciting time. So there is so many different ways to finance a film. There is crowdfunding that didn't exist in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's a way to both get financing and to get uh, fans and marketing power in advance for the film. And it's also a testing ground. You know, if you uh, have a pitch on uh, Kickstarter and nobody connect to it, you know, maybe it means that it's not the right thing to do. Now, personally, we have not done... um, ever any Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign, but, uh, you know, I commend people to do so and, and, you know, be happy to work with, uh, uh, creative and, uh, filmmakers that, uh, that want to go in that route. Uh, so there is that, there is a uh, product, product placement. And I think we live in a world that it's a lot more niche than it used to be. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if, if we, the world in the past was basically controlled by Coca-Cola or Bank of America and all those big brands that work only with big films. There might be opportunities now with smaller films that are more niche to get more niche product. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think brands also and, and marketers in the, the consumer product side, they understand it and they know the power of social media. They know the power of, of trending and, and they want to get their film out there, which is great. There is all of tax incentives and, and different, um, incentives around the world in the U S not as much, but, uh, for example, we, we just finished uh, shooting a movie called radius in Canada, mm-hmm. which is a Canadian, uh, production. And, um, it's the same team that we did turbo kid also in Canada. So there is all this tax incentive. So if you bring jobs to different States or, or different countries, you get tax breaks. So you really need to be creative about, um, the way you finance the films. Uh, and limit your exposure so you know you can at least recoup your money back and maybe make a small profit so you can do the next one. Right. So, so, but you are, as far as the whole like streaming world and, and going directly in self distribution, uh, obviously, depending on how much exposure you do have. So, if you make a movie for under $100,000, uh, as opposed to a movie for five or $10 million, uh, is self distribution a viable option depending on the budget? Yes, it does. I mean, in the end of the day, there is so many tools. I mean, you can put your movie up on Vimeo and they take a very small uh, share of it. And you can, if you're good in promoting your film, you can make uh, uh, basically like uh, the book publishing business that uh, now you have a lot of uh, authors that basically do uh, self-publishing. And because you don't need to print massive amounts to reduce the price, uh, I think Amazon has a program that they basically print a book per order, Mm -hmm. which is pretty crazy, you know? Yeah, no, it, uh, is, it is, it is. Yeah, and in the world of streaming, in the end of the day, it doesn't cost that much. I mean, there are costs uh, that I think some people, you know, sometimes it's easy to forget, but uh, cost of uh, the storage and uh, a redundancy in servers and uh, uh, the bandwidth, they are cost related, but it's obviously a lot less than printing DVDs and shipping them using FedEx to the other side of the country. So 
Uh, there are opportunities. Obviously, you know, everybody talk about Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and all those new entrants. I think it's uh, created a great opportunities in the TV side as well, because mm-hmm. TV was such a closed circuit for uh, basically forever. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, almost anyone can create a show and pitch it to those non-traditional um, platforms and get uh, shows financed, which which I think is it's amazing. Um, the 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 digital revolution, I think, created a very interesting marketplace that from one hand, there is more access. In the other hand, it's cheaper to um, to create content and to mm-hmm. create great content. And, you know, obviously YouTube is, is a great testament for that. Um, but on the other hand, because there is so much supply of content, the value of the content itself went, uh, went down a lot. So... Mm. In the old days, you have two or three channels and, you know, at eight o'clock on prime time, you can basically choose which one of those channels to to watch and they could fight over the market share. Now, people have so many ways of entertaining themselves um, if it's uh, um, between video games and, and YouTube or Instagram and user uh, generated content to to what we do. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like in the 80s. You literally just had to make a movie. If you shot something on 35 millimeter, it was sold. No matter if it was good, bad, or indifferent, they just needed content. And those yeah. days those days are very much gone. <laughs> and funny enough, uh, in the old days, like you say, you could make, uh, you can make anything and it would be sold. Uh, and, and it could maybe maybe be bad. But now looking at backwards, those those films have so much cult following and so much nostalgia. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, Seeking them and who pay double just to find where, where to see them. <laughs> right, exactly. The, oh, the, I'm a big 80s and 90s fan as far as uh, those kind of genre movies that, that were made back then. Toxic Avenger and those kind of movies that just were like, what? <laughs> Can you imagine a movie like Toxic Avenger? Well, I guess you could. You, I mean, you know, you did Big Ass Spider. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And they're uh, they're actually trying. I don't know how public it is. I know that they're you know also trying to make a, a, a bigger remake of that. And actually, I'm good friends with uh, Lloyd Kaufman. We sit together on the board sure. of uh, the Independent Film and Television Alliance. And it's funny that that you mention it because he has he put all of his films available on his platform. Maybe I can plug his service. Sure, a little sure. Bit. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know exactly where you go. I assume it's Toronto.com or something. But you can find. Uh, there is a way to subscribe and mm-hmm. uh, get all of his films for fairly low uh, price because you know he's he's a big uh, advocate of uh, net neutrality and, and allowing people to access the content. Right. He well, he's been on the show. He was uh, on the show a while ago, and uh, his uh, place to get it is on. Um, I think it's on YouTube, and you could actually subscribe on YouTube because uh, YouTube allows a subscription uh, platform as well. Uh, it's just encha- it's amazing, and I think at, at the end of the day, like you were saying, I think marketing is such a big part of and gaining that audience is such a big part of making movies today. Without it, you really it's really difficult to get to get seen unless you're lucky enough to get a distributor uh, to distribute a movie, and even then, you'll never see a dime more than likely. Yeah, and and you know, then you have big behemoths like Netflix. I mean, when you drive around in Los Angeles, all the billboards are Netflix shows. Yeah, I know, I know. I, they're every, <laughs> everywhere you go, it's a Netflix show, a Netflix movie, a Netflix original documentary. It's everywhere. I mean, LA is such a unique melting pot when it comes to that kind of stuff. You know, my yeah. fr- my friends who come in from the East Coast are like, "There's movie advertisements everywhere." I'm like, "Yeah, that's LA." <laughs> Yeah, it's it's Netflix everywhere, and then uh, around Hollywood we have some advertisement for uh, Las Vegas. Yes, exactly, of course. Yeah, so no. so it's Hakkasan and Netflix basically control the, uh, I, the outdoor advertising in the space. I mean, Hakkasan, you're right, Hakkasan. <laughs> I've seen so many of those billboards as well. Now, one of the films I always talk about as kind of like um, uh, models of p- that filmmakers should kind of follow is Turbo Kid. Uh, I kind of studied a little bit about how they were able to do their stuff, but can you share a little bit about, first of all, how you got involved with Turbo Kid, and then how, if, if it was either you or your partners or the filmmakers, were able to kind of get into that audience, distribute, yeah, what was the distribution plan, all that marketing plan, all that stuff. But first and foremost, how did you get involved with Turbo Kid? Uh, yeah, so it, it's funny you bring it up. I'm actually wearing a shirt um, here. I'm going to do my second plug. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I like to promote uh, well it's it's you know it's for other people but 
Um, I, I just got uh, yesterday samples from Fright Rags. They're doing uh, a whole line of uh, Turbo Kid shirts. Nice. And, and I'm wearing, uh, you can't really see it in a podcast. Of course. <laughs> maybe, maybe you listen very, very close so you can hear it. But <laughs> I'm wearing a skeleton shirt uh, that I just got yesterday sample. So uh, they should be out in the market fairly, fairly soon. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But yeah, Turbo Kid definitely uh, touched something in the audience. And uh, this Halloween, we had uh, we, we had on, we found on Instagram a, a cat in a in an Apple costume, and you know, just crazy stuff. But uh, yeah, Turbo Kid is an interesting one because uh, Turbo Kid has obviously a lot of uh, challenges. I think it's one one of those things that uh, it's almost like you can. You can tell anybody who's a writer or just starting in the movie business, like this is the movie you should not be making, right? right. But, uh, it's yes. a it's a very bloody film, right? It's very or com- well, it's not really horror, no. but it definitely speaks for the horror audience. It's comedy, sci-fi, adventure, um, with a little bit of horror dropped in. With a little bit of horror because there are like four thousand gallons gore. of blood. God, film. a lot of gore, a lot of gore. Yeah. And, and, you know, it has a name that, uh, you know, suggests that it's a kid's film. I mean, you, you'd be surprised, actually. Uh, <laughs> I remember when, when we start promoting it, uh, I, I was sending it to, and one of the distributors uh, gave me a comment saying that, that it's, it's just a bit too gory for a kid's film. Uh, <laughs> and, a bit, just a yeah, bit? So just a bit. <laughs> sometimes you get those emails that just your mind just blown, you know, it's like... <laughs> Um, maybe it's not a kid's film. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's obviously a lot of things going against it, but it really fit in our model, funny enough, because Patrick and I, um, we're, again, we're, we're, we're a bit different the way we do things. Mm-hmm. And we're really focusing on the people and the team behind projects. And this is why um, that year we had in, in, in Sundance, we had Turbo Kid, which is obviously a fun entertainment film, but on the other hand, we had another film in, Sun- in Sundance called Entertainment, mm-hmm. which is a very dark, experimental art house film with uh, John C. Riley in a cameo with Michael Cera. And, mm-hmm. you know, great film, got great reviews, but it just did completely the other end of the spectrum. Um, and that's because we choose our project by the people, not really by the genre or or by uh, budget or, or by any other qualifiers. And... Um, uh, Jason Eisner, who's you know executive producing the project, he uh, we we really like him and and you know we're trying to work together on uh, his previous film called uh, I don't know if you hear the helicopters but uh, it's that's fine. one of the signs of uh, being in Hollywood. That's very uh, true. <laughs> yeah, so we really like what Jason Eisner does. Uh, we really like his hobo with a shotgun. We knew we want to work with him. Uh, we have been uh, uh, talking with Ann Timpson, who's you know did ABCs of Death, which. Is very close to uh, what we do. We actually had a, a, a film called uh, VHS. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, also a horror anthology. Um, then uh, I wasn't there, but Patrick met Anne Marie, the Canadian producer, the the, the person who kind of you know ran the show in uh, Frontiers, which is a co-production market, mm-hmm. and really fell in love with Anne Marie. I mean, she just you know some people you can just have a 10, 15 minutes conversation and you just say like whatever you do, we're on board. You know, mm-hmm. um, so um, so Patrick came back, you know, all, all those kind of stars aligned. The, the directors, they're just amazing. You know, they're there again. It just you fall in love with them for the first for the first uh, minute. And then uh, I read the script and I go, this doesn't make s- sense at all. Um, so uh, let's do it. And I think it's one of those projects that <laughs> really, really like nobody would ever. Uh, put any financing in, but uh, but we were really the company. You know, the the we wrote a check to uh, to get to get the project done. There was uh, it was a New Zealand and Canadian co-production, so right. uh, uh, there is uh, there was a lot of subsidies and tax credits coming from Canada and and um, from New Zealand through uh, and Timson and Tim Riley from from that side. So mm-hmm. uh, it was really a great team. Uh, I mean, I know it's it's kind of. I don't like to use this, you know, the word visionary, but mm-hmm. it really is like a group of people that kind of come together. And it's like, okay, this doesn't make sense, but somehow we see that this will be great, you know? And, and it's one of those films that I got the rough cut, you know, and I'm watching it and it's like, well, you know, no comments, just, you know, have, <laughs> have them do what they do best. And, and, uh, 
funny enough, even after the movie screened in Sundance and got great reviews, I mean, the critics, they loved it. We got mm-hmm. uh, uh, great reviews and the fans were tweeting about it and, you know, coming to us in the street. We actually had Skeletron and and uh, Monroe and, and uh, walking around the street and everybody coming to me. Even then, not a lot of distributors actually showed interest just because the 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 mixed genre. You know, when you go to yeah. iTunes, you yeah. go to action, you want to have an action movie. You know, you go to horror, you want to have a straightforward horror movie. Mm-hmm. You go to sci-fi, mm-hmm. you know, you have... Um, it's an odd movie. No, qu- There's no question about it. It is definitely an odd movie that sticks out. It's not yeah. something that sticks into, into a, a little box. Yeah, so I think I think a lot of a lot of distributors, the way they look at something like that or, or financiers, they look like where would I put it? You know, in which bucket it falls into. And and I think that's if you look at the at, at the slate of the films that that you know Patrick and I uh, do, or or uh, we we do pick up some movies, but uh, you know that's uh, maybe a longer discussion. But um, you know, even Biggest Spider, you know, what is Biggest Spider? It's a co- comedy action sci fi adventure Monster kind of movie, thing yeah, you know yeah, it's yeah. it's we 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 like the fact that um that that the films are cross genre and a bit corky and a bit out of the box and uh when people say like well where would you put it how do you you know where do you place it well we knows you know the people the, the people decide it's not uh which bracket it is in, in your uh uh, sub genre on iTunes or Netflix, you know, it's, it's, if people like a film and, and they like the storytelling, they like the, the, the vision behind it, you know, they, they will connect with the content. Now, did you, did you, did you or the directors or the producers, how did you guys start activating that audience? Because it has a very rabid fan base. So how did you get that fan base and how did you nurture that fan base? So we were very lucky in a sense that we premiered the film in Sundance and then it played in South by Southwest and won the audience award over that. And uh, I think, geez, I, I can open my Excel sheet. I can't even count the numbers of uh, festival we played, but we played every major and medium sized and small festival sure. in the world. Um, and everywhere we got uh, great responses. We made sure to to be there or have presence and and have people know where to go to sign up for uh, the Turbo Kid fan newsletter or to uh, to uh, follow us on, on if it's a Facebook or a Twitter. We try to keep in touch with people through all those outlets. And and when the movie came out, we just had this army of people that. Um, they just were advocating for it. I mean, you, you can see the conversation. People say like, "Oh, Netflix is, is uh, Turbo Kids on Netflix. You have to see it." You know, it's, it's you know the, the people were really the ones that that promoted it. We put it up on, uh, I think it was sixty seven theaters mm-hmm. at the time when we when we premiered it, and we put it on uh, on uh, VOD as well mm-hmm. uh, simultaneously. So it's available for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's really connected. Uh, now we have. Uh, uh, a, a comic book that uh, that uh, came out of it, and, and oh, the merchandising! Have, Your merchandising, we have merchandising, we have shirts that uh, Fright Rag bring out. We have uh, a whole custom line. So next Halloween, you can be dressed as Skeletron or Apple or or the kid. Um, so we, you know, people just demand those things, you know, but you were, uh, but you built like a little, like a little mini star Wars in a sense, like you built an IP that you could start, you could start monetizing in multiple different avenues, not just the movie. In a a lot of ways, uh, very similar to like Kung Fury, they kind of use the movie as a marketing ploy to sell other things at at, at a certain point, which is basically, I think after the, there's a life of the movie that, so many people watch it on Netflix or something like that. But then after that, you're still making money with this IP for years to come based on the fan base and based on the merchandise that you're able to build. Is that correct? Yeah. And it's really is all about the fans. I mean, it's, it's, we don't plan to do this merchandising in, in a, no. in a plan to like, let's make more money from this. It's just, you go to Comic Con and, and, and other cons and just, you see people dress up as Apple and, and Skeletron and, and the kid, and then, you know, they demand those merchandising. And then we get approached by those companies saying, Hey, you know, people want to dress like those people, let us, you know, license and make and create those costumes. So, uh, it really is the fans more than anything else. Now, did you do any sort of self distribute a self distribution with this or how was this distributed? So this is where we're, we're very lucky that, uh, as, as a, as a, as an independent studio, we have all all the the distribution outlets. So we we have a theatrical department. We have all the relationships and and the the, the agreements with platforms. So 
we we release those films ourselves. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you have you have you already so you don't go through a distributor, or at least with that film you didn't go through a distributor. You just no. We yourself. have um, Epic Pictures Group has basically three lines of three companies under the group. Mm-hmm. Um, one is the production side. One is the foreign sales, which uh, you know, for people who didn't know uh, what it means, is that you know, in order to place the film in Germany or UK, or mm-hmm. we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Russia, you actually go out and license it in those countries. Um, and then we have a U.S. distribution arm called Epic Pictures Releasing that, you know, released films like Biggest Spider, like Turbo Kid, mm-hmm. uh, Nina Forever, um, and uh, Tales of Halloween. So we released mainly genre films uh, and family. So we just released a film called Space Dogs Adventure to the Moon, which is a, mm-hmm. a sequel to another franchise that we have uh, for kids. Uh, our main uh, two kind of, I like to call it pillars, that the ones that we have a fan base and, and we really uh, uh, nurture those sides is the genre and the family. So, uh, for example, for film uh, entertainment, which is Art House, we went to a different distributor that uh, uh, more experienced in that side. So for us, it's also to do what's best for the film, uh, not only just to release it. Fantastic. So then basically you've you've cut out the middleman in a sense by building up your own infrastructure to be able to sell and distribute your own movie. So you, obviously you keep uh, the majority of the income as opposed to the standard distribution of a, of a filmmaker just like going hat in hand to a distributor and going, will you please release my movie? And then you get the cut that you get the cut. But you guys have grown past that is what you're telling me. Yeah, that's that's uh, 100% correct. And and there is two things. It's in the good old days, there were just enough money on the table to share with everyone. So it's okay if you had a if you had a a, a producer rep or an agent that mm-hmm. sells it to a, a sales agent that he sells it to an aggregator and you know everybody's taking 10, 20, 30, 50% in the middle. Uh, but still, there was enough revenue to actually support a film. But mm-hmm. in today's market, the margins are so low, so you have to be close to the to to the market and and to the audience in order to have enough revenue to to the supply chain. It's just too long, you know. And and mm-hmm. it's to be close to the financiers and the filmmakers, which are the people that actually invest their time and money into the film. And uh, that's one of the things we do. But the other thing that um, the other um the other thing that we do uh the other thing that we do um that that made us create this entire chain is to basically have the filmmakers as close to the to the audience as possible and it's it's a little bit hard to to explain but uh, i i guess i'll give you an example so mm-hmm. you know we release a movie like tales of following right so mm-hmm. it's been this in in russia in theaters mm-hmm. so in traditional models, they're going to be a Russian distributor or maybe even a Russian exhibitor that works with a distributor that then he needs to contact um, the sales agent. The sales agent might got it from an agent or a lawyer that worked for the producer and then he gets to the producer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, if the, the, the distributor in Russia, you know, he has a radio station that says, oh, we would love to interview Neil Marshall to promote the film. Mm-hmm. You know, now you have this entire chain of people that, that, you know, by the time you get to the end of it, you know, three <laughs> months. Yeah. But we, yeah. In our model, because, you know, we are the people that made the movie, you know, the distributor just send me a text message and say, hey, do you think Neil is going to be available tomorrow? And I'm like, let me check. And I just send him a text message. Hey, Neil, are you going to be tomorrow at uh, 5 a.m. available to wake up to do an interview in a radio station in Russia? Great. Done. You know, so. It really helps marketing and and promote the movie everywhere. Uh, also, being close to the content, you also know a lot of secrets and a lot of uh, potential that maybe won't be realized if the product is just a product for somebody. Mm. And and I give you an example. Maybe one of your co-writer is Turkish mm. and he actually used to write and direct stuff or ex actor from Turkey. You know, if mm. you're you know, a sales agent insults somebody, you know that Michael Ironside in the movie or whatnot, Mm -hmm. but you don't have all that details. You don't know like, hey, you know, one of the writers, you know, wants to, you know, you can use him to promote the movie in Turkey or, or whatever that is. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's good to be very close to, to the actual, uh, films and the filmmakers. So, you know, all those little things and you can exploit it 
um, as much as possible because really today, in today's market, there is, uh, you know, demand is high, but the supply is a lot higher and you need to turn every stone to, to find the revenue to uh, pay back your investors and, and make the filmmakers make more money. So in today's world, in your opinion, then, if you have a film, uh, there's obviously outlets now to go directly to self-distribution outlets. You could do Tug for theatrical. You can use uh, someone like a distributor to go into all the major platforms like Netflix, Hulu, uh, so on. Uh, do you suggest if, if a filmmaker wants to start building their own career – to start creating this infrastructure that you've created on a smaller scale, obviously, and start building off of that as opposed to trying to do the old model that really is, is, is it doesn't benefit the filmmaker at all? Yes and no. Okay. Um, so, yes, I think every filmmaker and, and you know, I use the, the word filmmaker very broadly. I think that people work in, in our department or, you know, the actors, it's, you know, everybody's involved in the film business mm-hmm. um, should be forward thinking about building their own fan base and, and have social media and, and think about all of that and build that. Uh, so every project increases its, uh, its support. On the other hand, you also don't want to just put a movie out there on a, one of those boilerplate or, or cookie cutter um, distribution platforms, because as you know, for example, if you go to iTunes, if your movie just goes on iTunes, and you can do that. You know, you can put a movie in Amazon, uh, Vimeo, anybody can put a movie. But then your film is basically just on the platform. So somebody to find it need to actually go and search the name of the movie or, or search the name of, of the director or cast, mm-hmm. you know, to find it. Or you need to promote it yourself to push people to those platforms. So, and the, the difference is that if you are in a relationship with, with the platforms and you have the marketing power, you know, when you go on Vimeo or you go on Netflix or you go and you see new releases or you see mm-hmm. out this week, that's the stuff that people see and they can click on. So in a way, yes, you can release it yourself. And if, you know, and a lot of people that, that has that, that, um, relationship and enough, enough awareness, you know, if you're Louis CK, yeah, you can just put your, your, show on louisck.com and people will come to see it. But if you're just starting and you don't have that, mm-hmm. you probably want some help to get there. And also you want people that have, um, that have a strategy in terms of how to roll out the film. So you don't overexpose it and you actually go to the right festival, you put in the right time, you release it on the right platforms and in the right way. So, um, as an example, you know, like, uh, we, we have this film called Nina Forever, which we didn't produce, but uh, we met the, the filmmakers in South by Southwest. Uh, we sponsor a, a dinner there for the midnight section uh, mm-hmm. filmmakers. And we met them there. We ended up, uh, you know, going and drinking with uh, the directors were there and the producers and a couple of cast members. And we, we hanged out with them. We already liked them as people. Then they invited us to see their movie the next day. And then we watched the film. And I don't know if you've seen Nina Forever, but, you know, you look at it, it's like, yeah, this is like, this looks like a movie that we would have made. Right. Uh, and it's basically a romance, but it talks to the whore people. So it's, uh, for people who don't know what it is, it's, uh, the story is a guy that uh, his girlfriend died in a car accident, but then every time he has sex, she kind of comes back to life. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it, yes. No. Not traditional horror. I mean, she's not like a zombie running around trying to kill his, his new mm-hmm. girlfriend. Mm-hmm. It's a lot more about relationship, and it's really an allegory about letting go of previous and past relationships. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you have a dead girl that is bloodied coming out of the bed. You know, it will speak for the horror audience. Yes. So, for example, this film we released on Valentine's Day as oh, the genre alternative date night. And we worked with... Uh, theaters to give a glass of champagne with the movie ticket you know and you kind of try to customize and find the right way to release the film so you know if we just put it up on itunes you know it's not 100 percent horror it's not 100 percent romance it's Mm -hmm. i don't know probably it will just be another thriller on the on the platform and people Mm -hmm. have to search for it to find Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. you probably get no traction at all but uh using the festivals and using you know clever um marketing strategies you can find the audience Right. So, so, go ahead. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so th- that's excellent, 
excellent advice, actually. Uh, now, I was going to ask you if you if you were going to if you were going to do like um, if you were going to premiere at Sundance, let's say, because uh, I had a friend of mine who who won a couple of awards at Sundance, and she told me that if she would do it again, this is what she would do. I'd love to hear your opinion. If you're going to premiere at Sundance, arguably that's probably when you're going to get the most attention for that film uh, on an indie level uh, that you'll probably ever will. Again, you probably won't have the money to get that kind of marketing push, attention, reviews, and so on. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. She told me that if she would do it again, she would premiere at Sundance and for a week have the movie available on a VHX or a Vimeo for, for, for download, for viewing, uh, just for a week, like exclusive, so she can kind of monetize that attention. Is that a good plan, or what? What would your advice be? So I'm so glad you brought it up because this is exactly where the traditional way of doing things kind of don't really work. Mm-hmm. So what happens is you're a filmmaker, you make your second or third movie, whatever. It's great. You submit to Sundance. I don't know how, but you got in. Right. <laughs> right. Right. The moment the movie is in Sundance and and they announce it, you're gonna get a phone call from everybody in town. Right. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is that usually at that point, the filmmakers either been convinced or they're just overwhelmed. So they hire an agent or a lawyer or somebody to sell it at Sundance. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you use the 15 minutes in the limelight in Sundance to sell to the guy that's going to be selling it. Right. Right. So, So, yeah. So you have, you know, your movie now, like like your friend said, um, your movie now has all your attention and you're just sending now to the guy who's going to be selling it, that he's going to be selling it. And again, you kind of that hole that your movie is going to be released a year later, right. you know, and, and you kind of lost all this clock. And also we all know that in Sundance, you know, you have a handful of movies that have bidding wars for, you know, $10 million, mm-hmm. but there is another 395 movies that people forget about them, you know, two days after the release, right. two days after the premiere. Sure. So, and, you know, there was not a lot of articles about what happened with those films, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, my advice would be, which your friend is 100% correct, but I would do it differently. We always advise people, get somebody on board early. Because, first of all, somebody like us or, you know, company similar to us, first of all, we can help you get into Suns. We can help you get into the right festival. We can help you submit all this stuff so you don't need to learn all this thing on your own and, and you know, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of listeners go on Google and say, you know, how to submit to film festivals or mm-hmm. give a list of the top film festivals in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have a person in our company that that's what she does for a living. You know, she's in constant contact with all those festivals, you know, and, and know what they're looking for, know when the submission dates, know how to do it. So get in early with somebody that can help you with that strategy. Mm-hmm. And when the movie is actually out, uh, get its premiere have a plan how you're going to release it. Mm. You know, you either put it in Sundance and then a week later it's on Netflix or a month later it's in theaters or you're planning, for example, like Turbo Kid to premiere in Sundance and then you have a whole plan in putting it in other festivals for the next uh, six months before it's released. But at least have a plan so you don't have somebody who's just selling it to the guy that just two months after Sundance going to start thinking, okay, what is this movie and how, what are we going to do with it? And how so, we're going to sell it exactly? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what she told me. She's like, yeah, it, it get, you get basically nine months later or a year later, they release it. No one, you can't regenerate that interest. You can't build that back up. You you've got that moment, and and you should take advantage. So, but you would suggest not to do that like week long, uh, like release uh, on a VHS or a Vimeo, just to to mon- be able to monetize it. You would you no, would say no. no, no. Absolutely not. It's it's it falls again in what we talked about uh, about ten minutes ago. If you're Louis C.K., yes, you can do that. Uh-huh. But you know, Sundance have you know a few thousand people there. You have all the trades. From that to get to the real audience, it's a major major leap. You know, I, I actually recommend you know what? I'm going to plug another product again. I'm not making money from any of this. So mm-hmm. hopefully, sure, sure. okay. Uh-huh. Um, there is a business book about sales and product launch called um, I think it's Jumping the Chasm or or crossing the chasm, mm-hmm. and it talks about early adopters and late adopters and the actual world, you know? And yes, you can yeah. get people that go to Sundance every year, and that's the early adopters, you know, if you compare it to an iPhone or, or an iPad or something like that. But to make the jump to actually have millions of dollars in box office or have 
you know, thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of people watching on the VOD, it's, you have this gap that you need to get to the general and the broad uh, market. And that jump is really hard to do. Um, so in order to do that, if you a household name, you can do it. If you're Radiohead, you can just give your songs for free on your website and say to people, hey, donate as much as you want. But if you, you know, have a, a beautiful but smaller film that doesn't have the cast and, and the awareness to push it, mm-hmm. I would highly not recommend to just put it out there because once it's out there, it's already pirated. It's already, you know, the, the Got it. other people will not want to touch it, you know. So um, so don't don't make those decisions, I think, without actually having a strategy. Uh, what I do recommend is talk with people early. Mm-hmm. And this is the biggest challenge. And, and I know that because we're filmmakers, you know, we know how it is to get a movie into South by and have all the phone calls. N- don't get caught up with it because people are like, oh my God, we're going to make focus features, going to come in and you're going to buy the movie. Millions. Dollars. And, and it's like, don't get caught up with it too much because A, you can still do it, right? You can still actually <laughs> go out to focus features before and say, hey, this is going to be playing in Sundance. Let's talk early or have a plan and know that you can change it. You know, you can still have a good strategy and then say, listen, you know, we're going to screen in Sundance. If Focus Feature is going to come and buy us for millions of dollars, then that's going to change into that plan. But don't come thinking, okay, this is what's going to happen. And I really don't have a fall a fallback plan. Got it. So it's all about strategy. A lot of it's just strategy and just thinking about the long, the long game. It's, as opposed it's to- all about the strategy. It's all about talking with people that actually care early. I mean, we talk with a lot of people with films that are not even – you know, fall or, or will be an epic movies, but be happy to give advice. Um, also, just submitting to festivals. If you don't know the people, it's mm-hmm. also very hard. Mm-hmm. I always say it's almost like um, a lot of like, uh, putting your name on the ballot without campaigning. You know, it's kind of <laughs> you, you, need, you need to know what you're doing. You know, you need to speak with the people. You need to, you know, e- email them or talk to them and say like, you know, hey, you know, just. You know, just so you know, we have this movie coming out. We're going to submit it, you know, make sure, you know, give it some attention. You know, you kind of want to, to, to people to know about it because, you know, the programmers, they get seven, 8,000 movies a year. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, just imagine the, the system and the process they need to kind of flush out and bring all the stuff up to, to decision makers and actually put them in, in the program. And, and it seems more and more festivals are interested in bigger stuff that has distribution companies already behind them. And they're able to bring the director, to bring the cast, to create buzz. I mean, wow. if you look at, uh, sorry, that's wow. dog. It's all Lily. good. Lily. Actually, if you saw Tales of Halloween, she's in Lucky's McKee. Uh, <laughs> Lily, you want to come and say hi? What's going on? <laughs> um, so if, if you look at the Toronto lineup, almost all the movies already had distribution. Mm-hmm. You know? and, it, and it's great for the filmmakers and the distributors because it's a great platform um, to generate buzz and to get reviews and, and to get awareness for the film. It's great for the festival because they actually have somebody with a PR company and the ability to fly in the cast and, and to uh, help promote the festival as well. So it's a great partnership, you know, and if you are uh, uh, just a you know, couple of people out of film school just made a movie that might be amazing, you don't have that machine behind it that can help you. And it's not in a bad way, you know, it's not mm-hmm. like you need a, a money machine that is just, you know, I know that, sometimes it's it's easy to kind of look at a bigger company and say, oh, they just kind of put the posters up and they just have, but but the business is filled with people that started going to AFI and being filmmakers and just kind of learn from experience and moved up in the world. And, and there's a lot of companies that can help do that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point to make that there are companies out there that can help you uh, and get that attention that you might need from festivals and so on. I'm going through it right now with my film. My first yeah. feature film that I'm going through as well, and uh, I was able to meet some certain program directors and and things like that, so they're aware of the movie. And all you could ever do is hope to get it in front of their eyes. There's no guarantees. It's just about trying to stack the deck as best you can, uh, at least for them to just be able to watch it. And it's up to. And then at the end of the day, it's the power of the film, and if it hits what they're looking for at that year and that time. Yeah. You, you're absolutely right. And in the end of the day, a bad movie is not going to get into a festival just because somebody has a relationship. Yep. But yep. out of, I don't know, I can't remember the numbers. I think it's like 
10,000 movies, it's a mid to Sundance, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to slot in a feature film, what, like uh, 50, 100 movies? I think in know? competitions, there's only 13. And I think in features, I think it's about 100 some movies. Yeah, total. like uh, I, I took like all together. So yeah. they have a lot of really good movies to choose from. I'm not even talking about the band movies. You know, you can't just be a friend of the programmer and shove something that's terrible into a festival. Right. But imagine how many really good movies that would have been qualified to be there just don't have the room, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and we need to make decisions about what you're going to place this year and what they have to say. Listen, we would love to have it. Just this year we have, you know, too many great movies. You know, it's a, it's a good problem to have for, for. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. For everyone, I guess, for audience, for for the festival, but not for the uh, filmmakers. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> but not for the filmmakers. If you know, if you if you put fourteen movies into the program and you number fifteen, it's like, yeah, that's not great for you. You know, maybe a year before, or year after, you would get in. But mm -hmm. um, so, so like you say, it's good to know the people, and I recommend filmmakers to go to the markets, go to the film festivals, you know, go to the networking events, start to network. So you do know those. Um, programmers and you know two or three years later when you actually have a movie you can say like hey you know remember me it's like my movie's finally done you know can i send you a link and then at least they, they remember your name and it's not just another submission through uh uh one of those um platforms the online platforms is just submit submit films you know yeah you need, uh, you need to find somebody some audience for it. you need to drive some traffic of some sort yeah now what what do you look for when you're getting involved in a project so we really focus on the people, which means that it, the, the good news is that if you're a great person, um, you can get in. The bad news is that it means that usually we work with family and friends. You mm -hmm. know? So if you look at our films, there is a lot of uh, repeating directors, repeating cast. Uh, behind the camera, we, we have repeating uh, director of photographies and, and art directors and production designers and, and first ADs. Um, so, um, but it's because we, we know that we, when we get into a project, we are in for the long haul because mm -hmm. we do everything from development all the way to the distribution. So if you come in to do this movie with us, we're going to be together for the next four, five, six years of our lives. Mm -hmm. So unlike maybe, you know, some platforms or some distributors, or if you just want piece of the puzzle, you know, you get the film, you know, right before can, and then two months after can, you forget about it. We actually live with the people for a long time and we know that they're going to be really high highs, like, you know, going to Sundance and, you know, everybody giving you attention, they're going to be really lows, like, you know, being on set and it rains when it's supposed to be sunny and it's sunny when it's supposed to be rain and the sun is coming up uh, um, and you didn't finish your night or, you know, you know that you have creative conflicts and you're going to have big arguments and the next day you all working together. So, you know, we, we have, you know, we have a saying that making films is a marriage. It's not dating. Mm -hmm. Um, so we spend a lot of time getting to know the filmmakers and knowing uh, and, and, and having the right chemistry, you know, because sometimes like, hey, your project is amazing. I can introduce to some people. I don't think, you know, the chemistry is not there. That's a really, really smart way. And I've, out, of, out of being involved with so many projects over the years, that's the first time I've actually heard a producer really say something like that. And it's, it's a brilliant way to do it. And it's in, in this smart way of doing it. And, and the, the guys who are successful in this business, I mean, Clint Eastwood's had the same crew for 30 years, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and you, you build your people as you get along, yeah. uh, as you're moving along the business. And in the end of the day, this business is so hard oh. and so <laughs> risky and we can all make more money easier doing something else. You know, you can do a podcast about, I know, politics during the election and probably, you oh. know, get more. It's, it's, we all can, can make money in easier ways and, you know, have time to spend with our families and, and, and with our hobbies. Mm -hmm. But we're in this business because we love it and we want to be in it and you need to know that you have your friends along for the ride. Now, what advice would you give a filmmaker just starting out in the business? Um, whew. That's, uh, that's hard. <laughs> you know, it's, it's easier, you know, some things like there is no right answers, there is wrong answers, but there is no right answers. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're just starting in the business is first of all, getting to know the business. Um, I think that, that there is this, um, I guess it's an escape, you know, if you go to film school as, you know, in a writer director program and you just like, I'm just going to close myself in a room or in a coffee shop and just write, but you don't really learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you should be out there meeting people. And listening to advice, I don't have to take everybody's 
advice, but at least listen to people's advice and be nice and respectable and, and, and keep those relationship, you know, give your business card, take a business card, make sure to keep them because you also don't know, you know, I, I saw as a personal assistant, people that were, I remember we used to have assistant uh, meetups, you know, those people are now agents and people in high positions, you know, so sometimes it's also, you know, just take time, you know, to be there and, and to be uh, friendly and make those, those um, friendships. I think also it's important to know what the other side wants. You know, if you're a first time filmmaker and you have a small, you know, zombie horror movie that you want to put together, you know, don't hassle somebody from participant who's also only looking <laughs> for, you know, that he's in the documentary department sure. and all he's looking for is, you know what I mean? So try yeah. to know what the people are looking for. And there's, I think there's a lot more power in even coming in a party or networking event, you know, like at the American film market and say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, just want to know I'm a big fan of your movies. I have nothing for you now. Just want to say hi and my name. And if I ever have anything for you, you know, I hope that, you know, maybe you remember me from this interaction, you know, and, and we can do that. That's a lot better than trying to shove a script or, you know, oh, let me show you a trailer on the phone that you don't even know what the people are looking for. You know, so right, right. Um, we get about 600 projects a year. Mm-hmm. We make about five. So that can show you like how little of them come in. Mm-hmm. Most of those are going to come through somebody just for the fact that we are working with friends of him. You know, we're working with if somebody's like, hey, I, I had this friend, you know, we work together. I worked with him. I, I knew you guys are going to be clicked. Let's, you know, all grab drinks so we can introduce each other. You know, that's a lot more impactful than, you know, you get a lot of those emails that are like, hey, I'm a writer and uh, here is uh, three log lines, you know, and, and it's like, okay, you know, would you imagine how much time and resources you need to put to review like 600 projects a oh, year? Oh, God. Just, you know, yeah. just calculate, you know, just calculate the, the, the cost if you have, you know, a couple of creative executives doing that. And then, you, you know, when you start thinking about what the other side process is, you can start thinking about what is their pains and what is their uh, needs. So you don't just add to it. You know, it's like just to shove another script in, 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 in a financier's hand, you know, now you're just creating work for them. But if you actually bring value, you know, to the table, mm-hmm. then you have much better chances to move up ahead in the, in the queue. And also relationships. If you have a relationship with that, that person in one way, shape or form, that also helps. As well. Yeah, so, so Tales of Halloween is a perfect example. You know, we worked with Mike Mendes on Biggest Spider and a bunch of other things. We're good friends. Um, he's friends with uh, Excel Carlin that, you know, she told him um, uh, about her idea to do this anthology about Halloween. Basically, that was it, you know. So mm-hmm. Mike was like, hey, let's all meet together. It's all part of the same group. We, we hang out together. We, you know, we go to karaoke together. We do all that kind of stuff. So it's people, you know, they come, they say, Hey, we want to do an anthology about Halloween. Uh, that basically we're going to have a few segments and, you know, we're all going to direct something, you know, it's Neil Marshall that, you know, work with in, in a previous lifetime in a previous company and Darlene Bossman that we made a movie in 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, it just, it just kind of came out from, you know, just a group of friends. There was really nothing there yet. You know, there was mm-hmm. just a concept. Let's make a fun Halloween movie. And we're like, yeah, of course we're going to make it. You know, let's talk about what it's going to be. But don't forget that you can always change a script. You mm-hmm. can always change, a, you know, uh, uh, the strategy, the budget. You can always work on that stuff. But if you're working with people that you don't like or you have red flags or you're just doing it because of the money or because of the package, mm-hmm. the things are always going to be bad, you know? This a real, you, uh, sir, you seem to have it figured out. <laughs> 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 you try, you try, you, 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 you speak very wise words, Yoda. You do, sir. Uh, <laughs> very, very wise words. And I like to, and I, and I, I love the way that you're very straightforward and honest and real about your answers. And that's what I try to talk about on the podcast all the time because it is a tough business. It's an extremely brutal business. And, uh, you got it. A lot of people sugarcoat it or, or kind of tell half truths and stuff. And I always try to tell it as straight as it can be. Uh, and I appreciate you doing the same. Yeah. And there, there is, um, you know, there is a, a, a challenge in the business because, you know, a lot of people that they work for, for somebody, you know, they work in, in bigger companies and, you know, there is a lot of maybes in the business because nobody wants to pass on first gump and nobody wants to greenlit something, going to lose their company a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So 
you speak with filmmakers and lots like, oh, this company is interested and this company is interested and mm-hmm. this company is interested. But here is the honest truth. If somebody really wants something, he says, don't talk to anybody. I'm going to call my boss. I'm going to bring him today. I'm going to bring him tomorrow. Let's make it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, all of like, sounds great. Send me, you know, the next draft. Sounds great. Let me know when there's updates. That basically means nothing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and get people excited and get them maybe lose other opportunities because they think that there's opportunities out there that they can reach to. But I mean, you've been in the business, you know, it's 90% of the time there is nothing there because mm-hmm. people oh, don't yeah. really say no. You know, it's like yeah. I appreciate somebody say, no, this is not for us. I like you. Let me know next time if you have something that more fits what we want. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. That would be very refreshing if that was that was what the answers were in these meetings. But generally, you're right. No one likes to say no. It's the nicest FUs in the entire world. No one says F you better than Hollywood people. <laughs> I mean, if you go to New York, they'll tell you, hey, man. Screw off, <laughs> you know, but, yeah, but, 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 you know, but, but again, it's all about instead of taking a, a position of kind of being mad about it, yeah. you're just trying to understand the other side. You know, if mm-hmm. somebody is a creative executive, started working in a company three months ago, he's still learning the ropes in his own company. You know what I mean? It's still, it's not bad if you sit in a meeting and somebody says like, sounds great. Send me the next thing. Just like, okay, well, you know, can you please let me know what is the process on your side? What do you think are the chances? You know, what, you know, just you can ask questions and, and get kind of to the bottom of it. And I think the other side will appreciate it too. And you can say like, listen, you know, I know I don't want to pass on it because I like it. But to be honest, you know, I don't know if that's going to be the thing. So let's keep in touch. But, you know, if you have opportunities, go somewhere else, you know. Um, I think if, if you know, people talk to each other like people, you can get down to, to the business, you know? <laughs> right. You can get a lot farther if people just talk like human beings as opposed yeah, to robots here in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Just look look at, you know, two eight-year-olds playing in the playground. And it's like if everybody oh, interacted God. like that, then everybody would be happier and more efficient and make more money and could create more stuff. You know? Absolutely. Now, um, I always ask the same question, last two questions to all my guests. Uh, what is the, le- the lesson that took you the longest to learn in the film business or in life? Um, oof, that's a big question. So um, in the film business, it really is um, if, if there are any red flags, walk away because there is other ways to, to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause you know, a lot of time you have like, well, you know, this project, we love it. The director is kind of egomaniac, but you know, it's good cast. Or something. Just don't, <laughs> yes. don't, don't do that. Yes. You know, just don't, yeah. don't do a small movie with no cast. Then doing a movie with B cast, but Big the final tears wants his uh, daughter or girlfriend in the movie as the lead or any one of those things. It's like, forget about it. You know, it's like, I, I rather, you know, I, I can go work in a bank or, or whatever. I can Uber, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I can Uber. You can always Uber. <laughs> you can always Uber, right? <laughs> I mean, for now, soon enough. The, 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 yeah, the, the cars will start driving themselves, yes. So, so, so you know, for now, you can always Uber, but they're going to be, you know, for smart kid people, there's always going to be something that they can do, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that. In, in life, I think, um, geez, that's a big question. I think that um, somebody, you know, I don't even remember who told me. Somebody told me or read it. It kind of sounds like one of those Facebook, you know, inspirational bullshit quotes. <laughs> yeah. It says, if you do today what you did yesterday, tomorrow is going to look exactly like today, which kind of sounds good. But basically means that you kind of need to make the change, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and a lot of it comes because I know a lot of like uh, writers or or actors, you know, they ask me for advice, like, what should they do? And I was saying like, well, you know, try to create your own opportunities, Um, especially if you're an actor. There is so many opportunities. You can just grab another two friends take an iPhone and shoot a funny skit on YouTube. Like you can do stuff today. You know, it's mm-hmm. not that expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and also treat it like a business because um, it is, you know, we're all lucky to basically work in our hobby. And some people think that, um, that, you know, you try to do it as a career. You need to put at least the time that everybody else does. You know, if you work in a factory, you would at least work from nine to five put at least that time, you know, get up, get dressed, sit down and say, what am I doing for the next eight hours? Because I know that, that, you know, some people just like, you know, they, it's easy to kind of fall into the getting up late, 
having one meeting a day and, you know, feeling like that's a lot of pressure. But, you know, if you actually work in a company, if you're a lawyer, if you're an accountant, you're doing stuff all the time. You know, you every 10, 15 minutes, you're doing something productive. And I think it's easy in our business because everybody's a freelancer mm -hmm. to kind of fall a little bit and then get into mm -hmm. what you talked about it earlier. It's like, oh, that guy doesn't get back to me. It's like, well, it doesn't get back to you because that's a no, you know? <laughs> Like, he's not saying he's not calling you because it's a no it's like yeah. <laughs> that's great that's a yeah, great it's like oh yeah. like it's december there's no additions you know so whatever it's like it's december so you know everybody who's home and not flying to their own house because they can't afford it because whatever they're just ubering get him now and shoot you know the streets are empty go shoot something you know it's like you know get get something done uh that you can show value later you know you can build your uh twitter your instagram whatever that is now, so, now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Um, well, I can. I mean, there are films that I can always watch again, like uh, American Beauty or Forrest Gump. Mm -hmm. um, it is funny because I used to actually program. Um, I started with coding, I started in the tech business. Funny mm -hmm. enough, all right. Uh, but I remember. I think it was TBS. They used to like um, have. Um, the same movie like 10 times. Right, yeah, like the Ferris Bueller Day Off or something like that. They'll just like run it all Christmas Day. That's all they play. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. so I used to basically code all weekends because I wasn't making enough money in the movie business. So I was building websites and doing all these uh, kind of things on, on the side. So I was code all weekend. And I think Forrest Gump was playing in the background for, I don't know, seven times. And in each one of those times, you just kind of like cry in the same moments, you know, it's, <laughs> and you notice a few things, even though, even though it's uh, in the background. So that's definitely, you know, uh, a movie, you know, that I think, you know, but it need to look up to, of course, you know, the alien franchise, you know, that's, uh, oh, yeah. something that, you know, I would love to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always looking, you know, I once found a script that was, this is a perfect example. I always want to do one of those space because I'm, I'm big in cg and, and you know computers and computer graphics and i always want to do like lone spaceship kind of film and, sure. and you know i know to shoot it you can build a module or model in a green screen room kind of do those things really hard to find clever scripts like that i did found once a script like that but it was attached i swear to god there were like four managers <laughs> that, that were you know already getting like producer fees and their logo in the front and all sorts of crazy oh, stuff. Like, and, and I bet that script was never made because, you know, it's, you can't do that. Like, hey, somebody likes the script. You know, they want to put a million or two, whatever, to, to go out and make it. You should have it make it. You know, don't create barriers to, to, the, to the film. Do what's best for the film, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's another big lesson. We didn't talk about it, but what, a lot of what we're, trying, we, we're doing in our company is the movie need to be the most important thing. So everybody's interests need to be aligned with the film, mm -hmm. which is very hard when there is a lot of other factors and other companies involved that have conflicting interests. And for an example, this is why we do worldwide distribution. We do the, the U.S. distribution and we also do foreign sales because, you know, the U.S. distributor, for example, right after Sundance, probably want to go out quickly, right? Because you still have sure. the bad reviews. Mm -hmm. and but on the foreign side, you know, if you talk with the, the big companies, you know, um, they have to schedule 12, 18 months in advance. They need to dub it to German. They mm -hmm. need to, you know, do their thing. So, so, you know, obviously the U S want to release it quickly, but then, you know, a movie like Turbo Kid or, or, you know, VHS will be pirate everywhere. And then you lose everything on the foreign side and kind of everybody kind of need to be aligned and working together. And yeah, that, that was one thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, that we didn't talk about is piracy. Like how is that affecting you? And, and as far as your distribution plans are, because you're right, if you release something in the U S that's why a lot of times these big studio temples are released in Europe before they ever hit the U S a week early, purely for that specific reason to try to get as much money as they can before the pirates get them. And it is, it is a kind of way of life. You can't fight the pirates. It's gonna, it's just going to continue to go. But how does that affect your, your distribution plan? It affected a lot more in the past, and I think it contributed for uh, companies like Netflix to 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 grow, and you know, obviously, you know, blockbuster uh, disappearing and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think at this point, piracy is pretty much stable, mm -hmm. and I don't think it matters anymore. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you can watch a movie on Netflix. You know what I mean? It's like you don't need to go to some pirate site. Right. Um, right. It did kill the business in a lot of countries, you know, and and um. um if your movie, and, and this is exactly where it's important to have strategy in advance, because 
we really work to coordinate a release everywhere at the same time, um, or at least in the same window, because if you didn't release a movie like in Indonesia or something like that, some countries are so full of piracy that if the movie's out already, then nobody's going to touch it, you know? Mm. Um, so then maybe you can do TV sales down the road, but when we talk about genre, you know, it's, it's not the, the most TV friendly kind of content. So it's family, you know, content, it's easier, but something like VHS, you know, it's for theaters, you know, basically that's it. Um, in, in a lot of the countries, uh, they don't have, um, develop, uh, online kind of, uh, view the uh, markets. So, but I think it's stable for now. I think, uh, people also, um, used to use piracy as a negotiation tool, mm-hmm. you know, to get prices down or, or whatnot. I think now people realize and acknowledge that the people that pirate movies probably not going to pay even 10 cents to see your movie. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So it's not really a market. You know what I mean? It's not hurt. It's, it's not hurting you per se. It's hurting, but there is nothing like if somebody is downloading movies and watching them online, pirated. You mm-hmm, know, it, mm-hmm. it, you you you're not going to be able to take ten dollars from him to go to the cinema, or or you know, you you're just not. You know what I mean? On Netflix, you know, if somebody's already watching all of their movies on pirated online, Netflix is probably not going to get them as a subscriber until they kind of go older and they have a wife and they just don't have the time and the headache to deal with those websites. Right, to go and, and download and, and figure yeah. it out and the technology involved. I mean, it's not, it's, it's easy apparently, but not that easy. Yeah, you still got to know. It's easy when you're 16 and you have time on your hand, you know, when you're <laughs> 40, you know, it's like your kids want to see a film. It's like, screw it. You know, it's two ninety nine to rent it on iTunes. You just rent it on iTunes, you know? And, and, People that can afford it, I guess, you know, they can find it. But I know, like, for example, before we we, we had a panel before we released Biggest Spider in, in Comic-Con, and I actually told on stage, I said, if you can't find it or you live in a country that it's not available or you can't afford it or whatever the reason is, send us an email. We'll take care of you. We'll figure out a way for you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, we available through our YouTube channel, Facebook, everything. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, of course, everybody cheered and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, I'd rather people get it for free from me than because when you're using pirate site, you're actually supporting them. I mean, they're not nonprofit organizations, right? <laughs> no, they're they not. They make money, right? Sure, advertising, um, right. And, and a lot of them actually um, are part of uh, larger um, crime organizations yeah. that have porn sites and child pornography and human trafficking and drugs and I mean, if you, uh, we don't have, I, I speak about it in some forms about, you know, where's really piracy coming from and what's the effects. Um, but if people Google, there is a lot of good books about it and a lot of good information about the organized crime that involve in film piracy. And the other thing is that people I think don't understand is that when you pirate movies, you lose your, your, your privilege as a consumer to vote. So when we end up releasing Bigger Spider, we had, I think it was like over a million downloads illegally, mm-hmm. right? And and which was, I think we calculated that we had about a hundred illegal downloads to every legal ticket or or iTunes or, sure. or to do a uh, person. And then we have all these people that like, hey, we're not going to see Biggest Spider too. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> those million people that voted, you know, by lost their vote by actually contributing to the film. You know, you kind of lose that 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 opportunity because if if even ten percent of them would actually watch it in a way that that uh, we can create revenue, it would maybe make more sense to make a sequel right away. You know, and 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 get it done. Uh, this is why I'm a big fan of those uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaign because you bring that audience in advance. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, the, I'm, I'm assuming Turbo Kid was probably fairly pirated as well. It's, it seems like it's a one Turbo of those movies. It was fairly pirated. And again, you know, uh, it was fine and smart and it was not big, you know, that big of a budget to recoup and everything. And we had great partners and, mm-hmm. and you know, it, it was a very long process of, you know, strategy, how to make it, how to release it and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, some movies, you know, have more problems. Um, but in terms of piracy, it's, yeah, I think, I think people, you know, people complain that all they see in the cinema is just, sequels of the same um, temple bullshit right yeah but you know it's it's again it's because the consumer need to understand that when you outside of the marketplace you don't vote so if you go to see batman 
in the cinema because Batman is big and you want to see it on the big screen, but then you pirate the Turbo Kids of this world and the VHS of this world and the ABCs of this, of this world and, you know, the Hobo with the Shotgun of this world. You're voting basically to have the sequels made and the, the, the comic book and all the stuff that people keep complaining about and voting for independent films not to be made. On that note, sir, that's an excellent point. A very, very excellent and important point. So thank you so much. Uh, where can people find you, by the way? Uh, I'm so accessible. I mean, nobody in the world has my name. So um, you can find <laughs> me. I'm on Facebook uh, at Shaquette Berenson EP, which stands for Executive Producer. Uh -huh. uh, I'm on uh, Twitter at Shaquette Berenson. I'm on uh, Instagram. Shaquette Berenson. I know. I'm, I'm one of the you, most accessible people in the world. I'll put you. I'll put you on. Uh, I'll put the, a link to all your your websites and stuff in the show notes. So, yeah. uh, Shaquille, thank you so much for doing this, man. I really, really appreciate it. It was really eye opening, and I hope uh, I hope the tribe really grabbed a lot of the knowledge bombs that you were uh, tossing out there. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Shaked really brought it in this interview. I mean, thank you so much, Shaked, for being on the show. You were uh, you were inspiring, and, and you know, I wanted to also bring him on the show, guys, because I wanted you guys to hear someone who was doing a lot of the stuff that I preach about all the time: is creating that audience, creating that infrastructure, creating that ecosystem to be able to con not only do this once, but to do this multiple, multiple, multiple times, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat and continue to build not only a career out of it, but also build a company out of it where you can hire other people and start doing other things and become a bigger, bigger, and bigger. And that's what Shaked has done so brilliantly with Epic Pictures. And it's really just about thinking outside the box, guys. You know, just don't go down the well-worn path. You have to create your own path. And Shaked is a great example of that. So get out there and start making your movies and start building that ecosystem for yourselves, guys. If you want to get links to anything we talked about in the show, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 141 for the show notes of this episode. And don't forget to head over to FreeFilmBook.com. That's FreeFilmBook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobook from Audible. And as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.